On behalf of the Browning family, I welcome you to the memorial service and interment honoring the life of Bernard S. Browning, Rear Admiral, United States Navy Supply Corps. Please stand for our opening hymn as we process on, O oh God, our help in ages past. resurrection and I am life, says the Lord. Whoever has faith in me shall have life, even though he die. And everyone who has life and has committed himself to me in faith shall not die forever. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of grace and glory, we remember before you this day our brother Bernard, we thank you for giving him to us, to his family and friends, to know and to love as a companion on our earthly pilgrimage. In your boundless compassion, console us who mourn. Give us faith to see in death the gate of eternal life, so that in quiet confidence we may continue our course on earth until by your call we are reunited with those who have gone before. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated for the Liturgy of the Word. Good morning, family and friends. I was asked by my grandfather shortly before he died to read the 23rd Psalm here today. This was the very first biblical passage he ever memorized. He was only four or five years old at the time, and his parents were so proud of him that they had him reciting it at every opportunity, often standing him on a chair so that everyone could see. Dapa always felt a special connection to this passage. When he took the oath of office as a rear admiral, he placed his hand on the Bible at the 23rd Psalm. Just as my great-grandparents were proud of him so many years ago, I am proud to be his eldest grandson. It is my honor to share this reading from my DAPA, the Psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Please stand with me for the reading of the gospel. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If a man remains in me, and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you remain in me, and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given you. This is to my Father's glory 
that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Captain Wallace Howard Lloyd III. I am speaking here on behalf of my father, Captain Wallace Howard Lloyd Jr., who had the pleasure of knowing then Lieutenant Junior Grade Bernie Browning during their tour in England. I'm now going to put on the mantle of my father and read his words for this assemblage. It is with great sadness that I send this letter for circumstances beyond our control have prevented Lois and I from being here this day. I've asked my son to deliver these words on my behalf. One of the many pleasures of Navy life is the variety of people that you meet. Bernie was one of those that I was honored to meet along the way, and I consider him one of my dearest and closest friends. He was a professional and ethical man who took his responsibilities seriously. Many wonderful remarks have been made about Admiral Browning, all well deserved. But let's go back about 55 years and across the ocean to London, where I first met Lieutenant Junior Grade, Bernie Browning. It was 1950, and he was the supply and commissary officer for all the US, as well as British food items, for Sink Nelm, which is commander in chief Northeastern Atlantic and Mediterranean. The wives of most of the naval personnel knew Bernie well, for he was quite adept at supplying the special needs of the staff and the officers and enlisted men and women that served on it. He also rented a house on Binney Street that housed four single, low-ranking officers. There was Bernie, John Weiss, the aide to Admiral Fred Booth, Angus Curry, an intel officer, and me, the aide to Admiral Charles Cat Browning. Our British friends started calling our group of single officers the Barons of Binney Street, along with the Salvation Army band that played loudly early on Sunday mornings. We were the only Americans on this narrow six-block road between the U.S. Embassy and Oxford Street. We ate well at number 10 Binney Street because our chief cook and housekeeper, Miss Susan, was found by Bernie through a Czech friend. The barons of Binney Street enjoyed entertaining in addition to our regular duties. There were cocktail parties, dinners, and brunches on almost every Saturday or Sunday. Not all the time, but enough to make our lives interesting. Since two of us were aides to admirals and one a supply officer, most of our invited guests enjoyed the sumptuous parties that we threw. Of course, we always included our admirals and their wives, so there were very few regrets from the invitation list. Between all of us barons, we soon met a number of well-known people, among whom were, we really enjoyed entertaining. For example, Admiral of the Fleet, Lord Fraser, the first Sea Lord, equivalent to our Chief of Naval Operations, King Michael of Romania, Elizabeth Taylor, various visiting U.S. admirals, a Viscount, and some real barons of British nobility. I remember Bernie had an old Austin Mini that he used on a number of trips. He would never let any of us drive it, but we took a memorable ride from London to Land's End one long weekend, the details of which have been omitted from this letter. <laughs> In addition to making several other local trips, Bernie would remember them all, for he enjoyed traveling, even on the wrong side of the road. It was a great two and a half years, but all things must come to an end, and so must my recollections of the barons of Binney Street. As I mentioned earlier, Bernie was one of my dearest and best friends, 
So I asked him to be the best man at Lois's and my wedding in New England in December of 1953. He accepted and even arranged for a couple of Navy pilots to fly us from Washington, D.C. to Boston. That was Bernie Browning, always doing something kind for his friends. And so, with this, I must close my farewell note, looking back on more than 50 years. Thank you, Admiral Browning. You were and will remain a true and dear friend. Rest in peace, Bernie. You deserve it. Wally. Ernie Browning will always be remembered by me as the unsinkable admiral, the quintessential energetic business leader, and as a progressive political pundit. He will also be remembered by me especially as a creator of two enormously complex and successful projects. When I joined the U.S. Senate Small Business Committee, Bernie, as the influential chairman of the National Small Business Association, was the first person to darken my door. I regret it. What he described as a courtesy call was really the opportunity to bombard me with enough ideas for 10 lifetimes of legislation and public hearings that would help the nation's 15 million beleaguered small businesses. In particular, he wanted me to help persuade President Jimmy Carter to convene a White House Conference of Small Business, a huge undertaking to say the least. Eventually, the President agreed with Bernie, for he did exactly that. And now, as a major result, small business gets a much fairer treatment at the hands of government entities all across the country. Later, I joined the International Franchise Association, where the omniscient and omnipresent Bernie Browning was again a commanding presence. He had served as chairman and had earned the organization's highest awards. The White House conference notwithstanding, once again he was in hot pursuit of yet another humongous national project, the creation of what he called National Franchise Week. The staff member assigned to Hal Bernie, John Reynolds, said, after their first meeting, that he had gotten three insights from Bernie. First, what have I gotten into? Second, how do I get out of it? <laughs> and third, now I, now I know why they call them entrepreneurs. Well, I believe it was Bernie's very understanding wife, Adeline, who said, when they gave out persistence, they gave Bernie an extra dose. That persistence pervaded every board meeting for years and years. Bernie refused to quit pushing for approval of National Franchise Week. He was turned down over and over until finally he simply wore them down. His project was approved, but they got even with him. They gave him only a very tiny budget, just enough to make it impossible to do. But Bernie fooled everybody. Dozens and dozens of meetings, special events, and awards banquets were held. Governors and mayors proclaimed National Franchise Week and Congress officially recognized it, all of which led to a hugely successful major banquet in Washington. The whole thing came off without a hitch and was applauded by everyone, even the naysayers, as a great success. Furthermore, he won a double victory, for the entire project came in under that very tiny budget. But Bernie, not one to waste even a single day, told the staff that very night, this was great, he said, but tomorrow morning, we begin making plans to sell 1,000 tickets and to get the President of the United States to speak at the banquet next year. That's prime Bernie Browning, always looking ahead, always trying to make things bigger and better. He again proved against all odds that the difficult can be done today, but the impossible might take a day or two longer. I, for one, believe that had Bernie lived in the biblical days of Exodus, he would have organized a chapter of Rotary International, and he would have been elected chairman, and with Moses as his chief of staff, the children of Israel would have reached the Promised Land in 40 days instead of 40 years. <laughs> so it's impossible to simply sum up Bernie's many fine attributes and accomplishments in just a few brief moments. So I will leave it to the poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, to say it for me, and perhaps for all of us. He said, 
What we have done for ourselves alone dies with us. What we have done for others and the world remains and is immortal. Thank you. Let us pray. Father of all, we pray to you for Bernard and for all those whom we love but see no longer. Grant to them eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. And may his soul and the souls of all the departed through the mercy of God rest in peace. Amen. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sign but life everlasting. You only are immortal, the creator and maker of mankind, and we are mortal formed of the earth, and to earth shall we return. For so did you ordain when you created me, saying, You are dust, and to dust you shall return. All of us go down to the dust, yet even at the grave we make our song. Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. Give rest, O Christ, to your servant with your saints, where sorrow and pain are no more, neither sighing but life everlasting. Into your hands, O merciful Savior, we commend your servant, Bernard. Acknowledge, we humbly beseech you, a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Receive him into the arms of your mercy, into the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and into the glorious company of the saints in light. Amen. Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Amen. Would you please stand now for our recessional hymn, First verse, Eternal Father, strong to save, and then verses from God of our fathers.
Father gives to me will come to me, and I will never turn away anyone who believes in me. He who raised Jesus Christ from the dead will also give new life to our mortal bodies through his indwelling spirit. My heart, therefore, is glad, and my spirit rejoices. My body also shall rest in hope. You will show me the path of life. And in your presence there is fullness of joy, and in your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Ensure in certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ, we commend to Almighty God our brother Bernard, and we commit his ashes to the ground, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, the Lord bless him and keep him. The Lord make his face to shine upon him and be gracious to him. The Lord lift up his countenance upon him and grant him peace. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord, you now have set your servant free to go in peace as you have promised. For these eyes of mine have seen the Savior, whom you have prepared for all the world to see a light to enlighten the nations and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Rest eternal grant to him, O Lord, and let light perpetual shine upon him. May his soul and the souls of all the departed, through the mercy of God, rest in peace. Amen. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you in that which is well pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.
on this flag that's very flat.
So we thank you. And if Charlie Sigety could come up here, please. Where are you, Charlie? Here he comes. Well, I join you all in friendships, but I have one special status. I probably have known Bernie Browning longer than any of you, including the good Mrs. Browning. We were midshipmen together at the Navy Supply Corps School. I don't know that I could have detected the leadership qualities that he subsequently produced, but he certainly had social qualities that were very interesting. He, he persuaded us that he was prominent enough that a city was named after him. And since I came from New York City, I couldn't say that Sigurdy, New York, was there, but he could say that he was born in Browning, Missouri. Uh, many, some of you may be curious as to how it happened that we went to the Navy Supply Corps School as well as the Harvard Business School. And Bernie and I worked together for decades, really, in connection with the reunions that we had. And in fact, we were working together and talking together about our 60th reunion, which is scheduled for October of this year. But the reality of it was that in April of 1941, an agreement was signed by the president of Harvard and the then obscure Chester Nimitz, who was the chief of the Bureau of Navigation, and they decided that upon M Day, quote unquote, which subsequently turned out to be December 7th, 1941, 100 supply officers, 100 line officers would go to Harvard and to learn to become supply officers. We were distinctive in that it took 90 days to become a regular line officer. It took 120 days to become a supply officer. Subsequently, the Navy had not made arrangements as to what should be done with the faculty. They basically rented the Harvard Business School for the Navy Supply Corps School, but the, there were 58 members of the faculty. And for some reason, about a thousand of us, uh, spanning eight classes, of which of the thousand, Bernie and I were two, and we were allowed to remain behind for two semesters, studying under these noted professors of the Harvard Business School, studying the same courses, but the Navy gave them nautical names which I think enabled the government to pay for them. And then we went on our careers, we left. I went on to a heavy cruiser, Bernie went on, and his life emerged in a way which showed extraordinary success in the Navy. Those of you that were at the ceremony this morning know what an extraordinary experience this was for anybody watching the honors that were given to this fine man. I did not have business to do with him, but we agreed to work together in connection with the reunions and characteristic of Bernie's talent and goodwill, he and a man named Harry Magnuson tried to create a fund of $50,000 that would be made available for gifts and perhaps scholarships for the kin of Navy supply officers or enlisted people. I turned out to be the gift chairman of that fund, and recently it is more than $400,000. It may have emerged to be 500,000 probably, and there are literally dozens and dozens of young men in this century who owe the gifts that they get and the scholarship that they get to the foresight and the goodwill, if you will, of Bernard Browning and, uh, uh, as we call him, Moose Magnuson. So I salute you, Bernie. I greet the charming lady whom he married. I, in fact, I reminded her that I knew Bernie before she even met him. I knew him before any of his children knew him but he was an extraordinary man. We both were active, he became a rear admiral. I've stayed as a lieutenant junior grade, with great seniority, however. <laughs> so, why don't you hoist your glasses in salute for an extraordinary man. And now to kick off the celebration, we have four special songs that will start our CD play. So hit it, gang. Please listen and enjoy. Thank you for coming.
One stand on golden sands and watch the ships that go sailing somewhere beyond the sea. They're there watching for me. If I could fly like birds on high, then straight to their sides I'd go sailing. It's far beyond the stars, it's near beyond the moon. I know beyond a doubt my heart will lead me there soon. We'll meet beyond the shore, we'll greet just as before. Happy we'll be beyond the sea, and then we'll all go sailing. the shore, we'll greet just as before, happy we'll be beyond the sea, and then we'll all go sail. 